Yo, 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 yo. What's up, all you burner stoners and potheads out there? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you vivers doing out there this evening? Mrs. Weedman, how you doing? Doing well. Well? Well. That is great. Great to hear. I hope everybody had a great 4th of July weekend. I hope around the world everyone got to smoke big doints, whether you celebrate the 4th in the United States or whatever you celebrate around the world. Hopefully you smoked big fat clouds just because. We had a good 4th of July weekend. We had our first barbecue in over a year. Yay. (laughs) It was so nice. We had about 20 people over, and everybody was outside the whole time, so it was great, so we didn't have to wear a mask. And we, Mr. Weed Man, rolled 10 joints. Well, I didn't roll, sorry. Scratch that. I stuffed 10 (laughs) joints with some great homegrown cannabis that everybody enjoyed. And we cooked, we played bags or cornhole, depending on what part of the country you're from. Uh, We enjoyed ourselves with bunch of just great i made a great cocktail i call it the spritza if you all want to know what it is dm me i will tell you the spritz spritza we call it here in this house it's a phenomenal drink i drank 15 of them no you didn't all right i drank about 10 that's still too many (laughs) it was a celebration and i don't make my 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 cocktails that strong anyway so it was probably like half an ounce of vodka per per cocktail for so. five million ounces yeah, of sugar <laughs> of sugar straight up <laughs> <laughs> it was a very very super healthy yes it was a very very great day i uh, as rolling the joints and, and stuffing them and uh giving them out to to friends and family are at the house um because i'm not sharing joints like i've explained I gave one to my sister-in-law who doesn't smoke. Oh, wait. Before we talk about the story, why don't we light up, too? Sure. Why don't we smoke while we talk here? We're so. smoking some good stuff from yeah, we're Seattle. Smoking. Yeah, we we're still sm- have some of that lingering yeah, around. Yeah, we're smoking the Sour Patch. Not the Cabbage Patch, the old dance back in the 80s and 90s, but the Sour Patch. And it is uh, 21.9% uh, total cannabinoids. I think I've talked about this strain on the on the on the podcast before. This is our second joint from this. It's a great, great strain. If you can find it, great. It's by our friends that we really like their stuff. Pacific Northwest Growers out of uh, Lake Stevens, Washington. So, but let's get back to the story. So, I'm passing out the joints to everybody, and I give one to my sister in law, and she. She looks at me when I give it to her, and I was passing him out. My mother-in-law was here. There was family here. There was friends here. There was, you know, Dob Boy was here. T, uh, T, the tech, was here. So we give everybody their joints. So I give it to her, and she's just staring at it. She's just looking at it. And then she looks at me. She looks at this joint. And she goes, I'm not going to smoke this. I'm like, well, just hold on to it for sentimental value. You know, it's your first joint probably you've seen since you were in college, which was a long time ago. <laughs> Put it in a little container and look yeah. at it. See, Maybe one day you'll want it. My brother-in-law stuffed this for me with his own homegrown. You could have saved it. So, hence, maybe like 20, 30 minutes later, I'm, I'm cooking, and she walks by me. I'm like, hey, you smoked that yet? And she goes, I gave it to my sister. I'm like, oh, so now she's got two joints, and you got none. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> we'll get her to smoke one of these days. I tried all night. She was not having it. Not having it at all. She goes, what do you want me to pass out and throw up? I'm like, you're not going to throw up. You didn't even have a drink. I'm like, take a puff and maybe it'll loosen up a little bit. (laughs) I think eventually she'll try it maybe in a a smaller setting where she knows everybody and she's more comfortable. Yeah. that's. I think that's how most people would be most comfortable giving it a try for the first time. So. I don't know. I smoked. A, I smoked a, a lot. Of, I smoked a lot of joints that day. So and ate some edibles and drank a lot of the spritzes, and ate some brats and we cooked a lot of good food. So it was a great, great weekend. We actually got to go to the beach. We got to go to the beach and have some fun. So it was. We we spent some time time together and it was a lot of fun. And uh, I hope everybody else out there got to enjoy it. And lots of fireworks and lots of big clouds. So. Let's get started with the show. Enough storytelling for the for the for the week. So, I woke up July first to an article that came out from ESPN Radio, and the article was American Sprinter. Can you pronounce her name for me one more time? Shikari. Shikari Richardson tests positive for cannabis. Olympic hopes in doubt. That's an. It came up on my my. 
I get an email from ESPN. It came up on my email, and I was like, okay, what's this all about? So I open it up, and I've heard of her before, and she is the fastest woman on the planet right now. This young woman can run, and it's like when she runs on the track, fire comes out of her feet. That's how fast she is. <laughs> so I'm going to read the timeline of everything I followed and read up to today. And today is July 8th. I take that back. I think it's pro- pronounced Shikari. 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 Because her Twitter tag is it's Carrie. So I'm guessing that she's Shakari. Shakari. Yes. Okay. Well, hopefully we get it right. Sorry about it. I've heard we, her name so many times this week, but for whatever reason. Right. And I've yeah. read her name so many yeah. times this week. So Shakari. So we apologize. Shakari. Shakari. She's an American sprinter, was going to the Tokyo Olympics, and she tested positive for cannabis. And this was told by Reuters on Thursday. And she is un- she was unlikely to get the chance to challenge the Olympic 100 meter in the title in Tokyo uh, later this month. One source familiar with the matter told Reuters the positive test came at the U.S. Olympic trials last month where Richardson established herself as a gold medal contender by winning the 100 meters in 10.86 seconds. Um, I'm going to say something. People that use cannabis every day or use it every once in a while or use it to, to, to just relax and help. It's not an enhancement. It, it, to... Uh, if anybody says that you got you get screwed up because of cannabis, right here, the 100 meters in 10.8 seconds, it'd probably take me about a minute to oh. run 100 meters. 100 meters? <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Oh, it's if you crawl. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd probably be at like a, a 16 second. That'd be fine. But I'll getting from that. 16 seconds to 10 <laughs> is a big fucking deal. She's, oh, sorry, my French. She uh, is really freaking fast. 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 So if you're telling me one right there in that one caption, you're telling me one that cannabis makes you dumb, it makes you lazy, it makes you not want to do anything. Well, I, right there in that one, one, two, three, four, five words, right there proves a point that cannabis doesn't affect your athleticism. Sorry, right there. I can enough said, but I'm gonna go on. A positive test during the trials would mean all of Richardson's results from the meet would be wiped out, voiding her victory in the 100-meter final. Another source familiar with the matter told Reuters that Jenna Pardini, who finished fourth in the final, had already been approached to run to the, for the U.S. in the 100 meters in Tokyo. Both sources requested anonymity to Reuters due to the sensitivity of the matter. Calls and emails by Reuters to Richardson's agent, uh, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, and U.S. Track and Field went unanswered that was last Thursday. In a cryptic tweet early in the day, Richard wrote, I am human. Like, I want to, like, draw a tear right there. The 21-year-old will appear, she appeared on uh, on the NBC Today show, uh, and that was Friday. The network confirmed uh, that to Reuters, and she did a great speech on the Today show, explained the whole situation. So hold on, let's go more into this. Richardson was billed to run in the 200 meters in Stockholm Diamond League meeting in Sweden this weekend, but she was not on the entry list for the meet's official website on Thursday. Cannabis is banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency, but if athletes can prove their their ingestion of the substance was unrelated to sports performance, then the suspension of three months rather than the the, uh, usual four years is imposed. If an athlete is willing to undertake an approved treatment program in collaboration with the National Anti-Doping Body, then the ban can be reduced to one month. The Texan was aiming to become the first American woman to win the Olympic 100-meter title since Gail Devers in 1996 after posting a 10.72 seconds in April, one of her five runs under 11 seconds this season. She's fast. A 30-day ban back to the time of the adverse result could have Richardson clear to race in the 4x100-meter relay on the Olympics of August 6th if selected by the U.S. ATF. There are six athletes entered in the 4 100 pool. Four are qualifiers based on their performance. In the 100-meter individual race, and two will be named by the U.S. ATF, so Richardson could have a chance to participate. Richardson could also appeal any sanctions to the Court of Operation for Sport, CAS, as could any other sports body who felt punishment was too lenient. Okay, so that was July 1st. Now, the next one that kind of irked me. White House declines to defend runner suspended from Olympics over cannabis test. 
while lawmakers se- step up. And this was July 2nd. So let's go a little further. The White House on Friday declined to condemn a U.S. Olympic panel for suspending a, f- a famed sprinter over a positive test for cannabis, adding another level of frustration for advocates who have sharply criticized the administration for firing its own staffers over cannabis use. Meanwhile, a bar bipartisan group of members of Congress spoke out against the penalty on the athlete. Shikari Richardson, known as the fastest woman in America, was set to complete the Tokyo Olympics this month before testing positive for THC in a violation of the United States Anti-Doping Agency policy. The runner admitted to consuming cannabis in Oregon, where cannabis is legal for adult use, after learning about the death of her biological mother during a press interview. So she was basically. I think using, it was her grandmother. No, it's, it was her, her mother. mother. Oh. It was basically used to help in the morning. Mm-hmm. Totally. Not legit. early morning, right. morning of her morning mother's of the death. death. Mm-hmm. So now here, here's a catch. Asked whether President Joe Biden supports the one month suspension, suspension or would like to see a reversal to allow the athlete to participate, White House Press Secretary Jen Paskey said this was an independent decision made by the U.S. Anti Doping Agency and not a decision that was, would be made by the U.S. government. Paskey did not did go on to note that Richardson is an inspiring young woman who has gone through a lot personally, and she also appears to be one of the fastest women in the world. And that woman will miss a key Olympics event given to one month suspension. Suspension. However, the punishment is set to end by the, the time she would potentially participate in the other race, like we've talked about. The important part of the story as well, Patsky said, so this is an independent decision by the U.S. doping agency, but I felt it was important to note who, who she is and her history. But while the press secretary seemed to emphasize with the runner and acknowledge her talent, she didn't directly address the question about where President Joe Biden stands and gave a notable response that pitted full responsibility on the country's athletic governing body. For advocates, the administration's declining to take a stand in defense of the sprinter is another disappointment and signals again that it is willing to stand up for reform, even in unique circumstances like Richardson's case. And at the t- same time that it's choosing not to expo- uh, explicitly criticize the sports-related sanction, the administration has come under fire this year for terminating or otherwise punishing staffers who were honest about the cannabis. cannabis. Okay, I'm I don't need to talk about past cannabis. The one thing that irked me was when Joe Biden... Won't even answer. He did. He was in a store, and he was in a store walking, and press walked up to him and asked him what he thought about what happened to Miss Richardson. And he said, rules are rules, but we will look into it. <laughs> That's such a brush off. So Biden suggests... Now, here's the craziest thing about it. So Biden... The White House, nothing. The rules are rules. Okay. I could say a lot about that, and I won't. <laughs> the whole entire United States government needs to look at rules or rules before we go any further. Uh, so now here's another one. This is on Ju- uh, July 3rd. Biden suggests anti-cannabis rules for athletes could change following Richardson's suspension. President Joe Biden suggested on Saturday that rules banning Olympic athletes from competition for cannabis could potentially change. Why not change them now, Joe? The rules are rules, and everybody knows what the rules were going in. He said when asked about the suspension of U.S. runner Richardson from at least some events at the upcoming games in Tokyo after she tested positive for cannabis. Whether they should remain the rules is a different issue, Biden added. But the rules are the rules. Sounds like a school teacher like mm-hmm. yelling at you. The rules are the, the rules. rules. The rules are the rules. Even if you had like some like legitimate reason to talk this through why you made this choice, the rules are the rules. Mm-hmm. They're just so hardcore. Oh, yeah. There's never a different way to look at anything. Yep. So there were some people in Congress that slammed the punishment uh, on Friday. Some key House subcommittee sending scattering letters to U.S. Dope, US doping agency and anti-doping agency urging the bodies to strike uh, below for civil liberties and civil rights by reversing the course you are on. Um, so... That was Biden's response, the White House response. Now, July 6th, U.S. track and field team says cannabis punishment should be reevaluated following Richardson's suspension. So the U.S. track team is all defending her. Mm -hmm. Why she used cannabis, why she's being suspended, reinstate her, let her run in that 100 meter, let her run in the 4 by 100 relay, 
I mean, she deserves it. She's trained. She deserves to be there. Sure. So she's got the track team's got her back. I was thinking about this two nights ago, and while I was in bed, pretty baked, my mind seems to wander a lot when I'm working on the podcast. So I was thinking about this, and when I saw this article about the U.S. track and field team having her back, wouldn't it be great if all sports took 30 days off? If everybody I, had her back. If everybody had her back. Not just amateur athletes, right. Olympians, which aren't truly amateur athletes. Or like don't stop get paid, but every game that goes, everybody stops at the same time for thir- like 30 seconds or for no. three minutes. How about them. they don't play for 30 days? Or how about they don't play for one day? Everybody stops. Even Something. the Olympians. On that day, she was supposed to run right. the 100-meter. Yeah. Nobody does it. No athlete across the world does who anything. support cannabis, especially who support cannabis legalization. If you don't support it, you don't support it. That's on you. But you should support a fellow athlete who's being wronged. There will be people who, athletes who disagree, though. There, I'm sure there, there will, will be. be. I'm there sure are. there will be. Right. Um, there's probably there's a lot of athletes that don't believe in cannabis. That's right. fine. That's fine. But believe in what she trained to do, just like all those athletes are out there training cannabis every did day. Not help her. If what? anything, cannabis helped her um, relax. It helped her get through the aches and pains of all the training. It helped her just chill. After, but who knows like, if she used it the whole time? She might have no, just used it yeah, once. It could have been, could have been just that one time that she needed it. She right. might not have used it for years. But you know what? She said to herself, "I need this. I need right. to like just." sleep and relax and get this off my mind for my a point bit. is is that it if an athlete can use alcohol why can't they use cannabis 100 percent. they can also it use painkillers they right. can also use yeah. they can use pharmaceuticals right here's the thing this is not a cannabis is not a drug it's not right. made in a facility it is a plant you've heard me say this it's a plant that was given to us as medicine as to to socially it help enhance us and perform nothing it's not a steroid it's not an antihistamine it's not codeine it's not anything to take it's not a drug just put it that way it's not a drug and i'm tired of people saying it's a drug right hands down i'm done with it it's not a drug it's grown in the ground it's not made it's not made in a scientific lab like pills and steroids and all this stuff i feel and i thought about this the day she's supposed to race the 100 meter every sport stop for the for ten point six eight seconds. Oh, her speed. That would be cool. Everybody. Yeah. Even in the Olympics. Even if you're even if you're in the middle of a pitch. Er, stop you the stop. ball. <laughs> yeah, that would be super impactful. That would be a world giving back to a woman right now that I feel has been wronged. Yeah. That's just my opinion, and I know Mrs. Weeman and I have had some talks about this. She's going to give you her opinion in a minute here, but I'm just saying for 10.68 seconds on the day she was supposed to run the 100-meter dash, everyone stops. Every athlete in the world stops. That's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. So the U.S. track team had her back. I thought it was great. And then there was another article that came out July 6th. Women oppose Richardson's cannabis suspension while some men or men support it, polls find. Which I think is very weird. Men, more men supported it? Support her suspension. Oh, support her suspension. Mm -hmm. Oh, that goes back to biases, female, male. Very weird. Yeah. More men. They surveyed 30,000 Americans Uh about the decision and somewhat surprisingly found that Purlarity, purlarity, 43% support the punishment, while 41% oppose. But a gender breakdown of respondents revealed an interesting divide. More women oppose suspension, more women oppose suspension, 44%, than supported at 39%. Hmm. Men, on the other hand, are more supportive of the penalty, 48%, than they are against it at 38%. What the hell's wrong what with you? What the heck, guys? Chill out. What is wrong with you? What is wrong? There was 30,000 people. But so still. So that's, that's not a hundred people. Very weird. It is weird. And then another article. Uh, and this was uh, July sixth. Miss Richardson's Olympic ban over cannabis is America's fault, and it is. 
I thought this was a great article because I thought about it, and I thought about the history of cannabis in, in mm-hmm. the United States and how we banned it in the 30s, and it was all a sign of racism, and it was all just about stopping something that was great because it was racist against Mexicans coming in over the border and bringing it over. And then it got into African Americans, and then it got into the 60s with the beatniks. So I thought about this a lot. And it is kind of our fault because we wrote the rules and the rest of the world follows it. What we've done, what we wrote about drug laws in this country, most of the world follows it. What we wrote about cannabis laws, most of the world followed it. About 85% to 90% probably of the world followed it for a long time. And most of the, the rules in, 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 for the Olympics were written by the United States. Can I tune in on that? Sure, 100%. Point? Um, This is part of an article that I found particularly interesting. It says, It isn't just activists who are condemning Richardson's suspension. Multiple members of Congress and federal candidates have slammed the agency over the move. Representatives Jamie Raskin and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, for example, wrote a letter to the U.S. ADA and the World Anti-Doping Agency expressing dismay at the punishment. The ban on marijuana is a significant and unnecessary burden on all athletes' civil liberties. The two lawmakers, who are respectively the chair and vice chair of the House Oversight and Reform Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, wrote, The divergent treatment of recreational alcohol and marijuana use reflects obsolete stereotypes about cannabis products and a profound misunderstanding of the relative risks of both substances. They said, noting that major sports leagues such as the NFL, the MLB, and the NBA are making moves to scale back or eliminate cannabis punishment for players. We are also concerned that the continued prohibition of marijuana, while your organizations allow recreational use of alcohol and other drugs, reflect anti-drug laws and policies that have historically targeted black and brown communities, while largely condoning drug use in white communities, they said. Um, A number of other lawmakers criticize the suspension in their social media posts. So there's people out there. I mean, this and this article goes on and on with all these different posts from different people in different political offices. And there are a lot of people supporting it. And it kind of plays off of the whole idea that laws are changing about cannabis faster than rules are changing, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know? it makes sense. Like, the laws are happening at a state level, not a federal level. The laws are changing at a state level. But then you've got organizations and affiliations and schools and all these different private entities that have their own sets of rules. So although it might be statewide legal or countywide legal, you've got, you know, your the club that you play a sport for or you are involved in is saying we don't allow it. So since we don't allow it, we're going to exclude you because you use it. So until everybody changes their rules, we're going to keep seeing stuff like this. So in some ways, it's like she knew the rules, right? And she she played a, a pretty risky move, right? She smoked, right? Whatever. And like she, she said, said, I'm human. Right. <laughs> she was in a, a bad moment, and she smoked. All, I, I, I don't, you know, I'm not someone to say that that's wrong. I think that that's fine. But she did know that, she was putting herself at risk, I'm sure. And then, or maybe she was even just in a room and everybody else was smoking. Or did she say no, that she, she, smoked. she said she smoked? Yeah. Um, so she put, she made a risky decision. She said, I'm human. I mean, she is 21, right? So it's just a matter of these rules haven't changed yet. So it sucks. She's in this bad predicament. But in a lot of ways, she's created this huge limelight around this. And if anything, it is going to encourage the doping agency to get with the times. I hope she becomes the new face of cannabis yeah. and they kick Ryan Sandberg to the curb. Yeah. <laughs> and she's on every billboard all, right? over, all over 294 and 55. Yeah. So Those are our highways here in Chicago land. Um, so going back to the uh, where it's, it could be our fault or it is our fault because we write the rules. Biden could possibly change this from what I'm reading here. And the whole world generally follows what the United States writes about drug laws and and the war on drugs. 
and that was said by Dr. Peter, Peter Grinspoon, a physician and professor at Harvard Medical School who also writes and speaks about drugs. They've also followed the U.S. largely in cannabis policy to the profound detriment of millions of people and, um, uh, and of medicine and research and so forth. Here was a great quote. If it's a performance enhancing, why did you spend 60 years saying it causes a motivational syndrome? And if it harms the athletes, how is it a performance enhancing? I thought that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Cannabis is banned in the Olympics by the World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, which regulates the chemical intake of athletes in the Olympics and most professional soccer players. But most major U.S. sports, nor the NCAA, created after the doping scandal plagued in 1998 toward de France, WADA has updated its policy on cannabis several times in the past 20 years. Athletes can now use CBD, for example. But under the most recent ban list published in September, WADA still bans THC. As explained by the U.S. Doping Agency, the outfit that manages drug testing programs for U.S. Olympic athletes under WADA rules. WADA bans substances if they meet at least two out of three criteria. The substance must pose a health risk to athletes. Well, we already know that cannabis doesn't because she's the fastest woman in the world. It must have the potential to enhance performance. Well, we just read that it doesn't. And most ambiguously, it violates the spirit of the sport. Now, I'm going I'm to talk about this for a second. It violates the spirit of the sport. There was a ton of Twitter from former Olympi Olympians that said they were high during the Olympics hmm. or they got high after they were done with the Olympics or some of them smoked before they got tested. So how does that violate the spirit of the sport? You all know that people smoke. Michael Phelps smoked cannabis he, and, every, and he admits it. And it helped him because he has... What ADHD or or I think he just had depression. Depression. Mm -hmm. I think he had Maybe ADHD anxiety. too, or yeah. um, what's the other one? Obsessive compulsive OCD. Disorder. OCD. One of those, and it helped him be able to function and t and be able to train to get his mind right because it helps with that. Cannabis meets all three criteria according to this according to what Wada says. And the science laid out paper towel cannabis and sports anti-doping perspective published in the November 2011 edition of the journal Sports Medicine. So, what else can the U.S. do to fix this, though, if we can? Let's see here. So, they're saying that you should contact WADA, also contact your senators. It's about helping to change the laws. The United States can... Act up on this. The United States government can go decriminal, at least decriminalize it, get it off the schedule one, and prove to the world that if we can do it, everybody in the world can do it if they want. And start researching it and showing that it's not a drug, it's not bad for you. And all this stuff that's in these articles that I've been reading can help. Here was something I thought was actually really cool, too. Um, it was a petition to reinstate her uh, f close to 500,000 signatures, which I thought was awesome and growing. <laughs> now, July 8th, the White House and U.S. Anti-Doping Agency criticizes cannabis ban after Richardson's suspension. <laughs> <laughs> the plot thickens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's read this. A growing choir of prominent voices are calling for the reevaluation of Olympic policies that punish athletes for cannabis after a U.S. runner Richardson was suspended over a positive test. Now the White House press secretary and the U.S. anti-doping agency are suggesting it may be time for a change. While press secretary Jen Psaki previously declined to condemn Olympics official sanctions on Richardson when asked about the issue at a briefing with reporters, she told CNN on Wednesday that the case highlights the need to take another look at the rules of cannabis. Yeah, because your shit was blowing up. The whole White House was getting blown up with phone calls, probably, and emails, and everybody, all their centers, and everybody was getting blown up about this, and all everything was on social media about it. Her quotes. It does stink, she said, 
when asked about the decision to bar the athlete from a second event that fell outside the scope of the 30-day suspension. I don't think there's a better definition of it. She has lost her mother. She had gone through a tragedy, and she's also the fastest woman in the world. And I think she's sending a message to a lot of little girls out there, you can do this. That's from Paskey. We know the rules were, are, the, are where they are. Maybe we should take another look at them. We certainly have to respect the role of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency and the U.S. Olympic Committee in the decisions they make, but it is sad. Now she says that. Meanwhile, the USDA itself issued a statement on Wednesday that similarly expressed sympathy for Richardson and indicated the cannabis ban may, may need to be lifted. Lift it now! Lift it now! Stop talking about it. First, it is explained that while the U.S. government has a seat at the table to provide feedback and will continue to speak up for athletes, we are ultimately bound to the WADA rules. This is true even sad enough in tough cases like this one where we might make a different approach if the choice was to, ours to make, it said. While the rules are here are clear, it is a terrible situation. Inclusion of, of cannabinoids, including cannabis, on a prohibited list have been vigorously debated by WADA's inception back in 2003. It continued. Many now support it being removed since the list be primarily about performance-enhancing substances and because cannabis is widely available in certain countries. However, many also agree from a sport health and safety standpoint that it should remain on the list to prevent possible impairment and serious injuries during competition. USDA said, These cases are heartbreaking for us, but it is hopeful that this case can be used as an example and to the reasons why it's time to revisit the issue. The outpouring of support for Richardson has been limited to the White House of USDA U.S. Track and Field uh, also said this week that the international policy and cannabis punishments for athletes should be reevaluated. For example, President Joe Biden said on Saturday, rules are rules, we said. The bipartisan from all Congress, you know, talking about her punishment. Uh, also, Nevada sports regulators voted on Wednesday to make it so that athletes will no longer be penalized over positive cannabis tests in the state of Nevada. Wow, that's great. Good for you, Nevada. Uh, NFL's drug testing policy change... Uh, a ton last year. Uh, the MLB in 2019 to remove cannabis from the league's list of banned substances. Uh, they can't work while under the influence. That's in the in the in the MB, uh, Major League Baseball. NBA policy not to randomly drug test players for cannabis amid the coronavirus pandemic may soon become permanent. The league's top official said in December. So all these big sports industries are, are taking cannabis off their list, but the the Olympics is one of the most watched. The Summer Olympics is one of the most watched things, especially if people like gym, uh, gymnastics or track or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's time for it to get taken off. And Mrs. Miss Richardson, we're, we're, we're hoping that things change. Hopefully you get to run in something. I think it's... Uh, I feel terrible. I've been following this and researching and reading and put this whole timeline together. I My last thing I'm going to say on this one is... On the day she was supposed to run the 100 meter, every athlete in the world, 10.68 seconds, stop playing your sport. Training, whatever you're doing, in honor of be the fastest woman in the world. That's all I got to say about that. Hmm. How you feeling, Mrs. Weed, man? I'm all right. Yeah? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> the sour patch. The Sour Patch is good. It keeps your head clear. It does. Yeah, but my body is super chill. What What's about cannabis buyers that we... I'm a cannabis buyer. Mm -hmm. What What's the industry all about with cannabis consumers, buyers? Can they make it equitable? Can they make it sustainable? Can they make it a thing? I, I think we can. Nice. Right? Tell us all um, about it. I've got an article here about that. And we're going to talk about how the industry could become more equitable and sustainable. Um, although cannabis consumers are highly focused on safe, high-quality products that are effective, how often are consumers thinking about the ethos with which the cannabis companies operate? Ha-ha. Right? Mm -hmm. Different angle. 
As the cannabis community continues to evolve, many are realizing that buying responsibly from companies who care can make a real difference in the industry and in the world. After all, the process of buying cannabis is different from buying other products in so many ways. Legalization creates layers of complexity for the buyer's journey, depending on the geography of that journey. But to really understand how different buying cannabis is when compared to buying most other products, it's important to look in two other directions, equity and sustainability. First, it's, the, it's important to take a look back in history, specifically at the American media, where false information has been propagated for decades. Nearly a century ago, in fact, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, now called the DEA, renamed cannabis marijuana. In the 1930s, according to Robin Lawrence, author of Pot in Pans, A History of Eating Cannabis, the U.S. government rolled out a rebranding campaign depicting cannabis as a frightening new drug used primarily by Mexicans and African Americans that could turn up upstand that could turn upstanding middle class white kids into helpless victims and raging monsters. Jeez, Louise. <laughs> then in 1994, Harper's Magazine interviewed former domestic policy chief John Ehrlichman who admitted in that interview that the government intentionally criminalized hippies and black people in order to disrupt those communities. Ehrlichman is quoted as saying, we could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about drugs? Of course we did. And from there, the rest is history. Today, research conducted by the ACLU shows that there is racial profiling and bias in cannabis enforcement. Black people are 3.6 times more likely than white people to be arrested for cannabis possession, despite similar usage rates. Hmm. Contrary to what many might believe, this disparity has not improved during the last decade. That's a shame. In fact, the trends have become more alarming in most states. But there is hope. Cannabis buyers who are committed to restoring equity can take small steps in order to create a brighter future. So what can you do? Well, buying ethical weed is one solution. Buyers can support organizations committed to ensuring some of the revenue generated is rerouted to rebuilding communities and preventing unjust and inequitable incarceration. Ask your dispensary about their ethical practices, and if they can't provide any, find one that can. Or if you buy online, do some research. Use your voice, your vote, and your wallet. Contact your senators and representatives to rail against biases in marijuana enforcement. Support organizations like the Drug Policy Alliance, which works to fund prisoner reentry programs, or invest in communities that have been heavily affected by biased mass incarcerations. Then we talk about sustainability. There are initiatives uh, making their way onto the corporate radar across a variety of industries, and the cannabis sector is no different. Some find it ironic, considering the cannabis plant on its own is quite sustainable. Cannabis grows quickly in a wide array of atmospheric conditions, after all. Cannabis can be called eco-friendly. Farmers in Italy have been known to cultivate cannabis in order to decontaminate polluted soil. That's super cool, That's right? Awesome. And the hemp varietal actually absorbs and reduces global atmospheric carbon dioxide. But despite the product's environmental friendliness, the cannabis sector of the economy is not so environmentally friendly. Here's where it goes down. The legal cannabis sector struggles to li live up to the carbon negative hype of the plant itself. Sustainability in the cannabis industry is hampered by lighting, irrigation, and packaging problems. Indoor growing practices to generate just one kilogram of cannabis can, ca can produce as much carbon dioxide as three million cars, according to a study by the Global Footprint Network. One single plant can consume as much as 150 to 250 gallons of water to reach the flowering state. Shit. This is in a commercial grow. Right. Uh, because of hefty federal requirements, many companies resort to plastic packaging for its affordability. And that plastic can be up to 30 times. Did you hear that? 30, three, zero times the weight of its contents. Damn. That's insane. 
So what can you do about this? How can you help with sustainability, right? Well, how often do consumers give thought to where their product is coming from and where the packaging ultimately goes? According to, according to one Nielsen report, 73% of millennials are willing to pay more for sustainable goods, and this includes packaging. When more consumers become mindful about where their product is coming from and where the packaging ultimately goes, this percentage can surely increase. Look for responsible dispensaries and packaging take-back programs like one started in early 2020 in Colorado, where vape cartridges, they can't be... Um, they can't be recycled and other plastics that go out the door with customers are taken back in an effort to avoid clogging up the recycling system. Many cannabis businesses tout their innovative ideas for remaining profitable and keeping an eye on ethical practices and sustainability. But there's one company that lets those pra practices lead and is seemingly still keeping an eye on profitability. The company clearly states on their website, we will never put profits over a clean and beautiful earth. Pure Beauty is a Los Angeles company with a brand that combines cannabis with ultra-hip streetwear vibes. The company, who prioritizes a high-quality flower, also has a serious moral compass. The female and minority-owned company views the history of injustice within the industry as a call to action to promote equity and fairness. Pure Beauty donates a portion of their proceeds to fund programming for current and post-incarcerated populations. That's not all. At Pure Beauty, all of the water used in their cultivation is collected from the air. Not one drop comes from a California tap. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah, California is always yeah. in a drought, too. The cultivation practices have zero runoff because even eco-friendly fertilizers and nutrients can contaminate surrounding water supplies, making life inhabitable for indigenous species. So they have no runoff. They're collecting air and creating water from it. Super cool. Uh, Pure Beauty also creates soil food webs for insects and then donates byproduct soil to public parks. So they're also giving back. And while they are legally bound to properly package their products, Pure Beauty makes every effort to use as little packaging as possible. Most of their packaging material is paper, and they've been perfecting a child-resistant Mylar bag made from plant starch. Just when it seems Pure Beauty sounds too good to be true, they top it off with modesty and say, we're not perfect, but we're trying. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. So do a little research, you know. Uh, maybe you don't have the option of going to a dispensary that is doing their best to be, you know, um, you know, carbon, zero carbon footprint or, you know, only working with companies that, you know, do better at packaging to, you know, not use so much plastics. Maybe your dispensary isn't the place where you're going to find the sustainability and the equity, but your products could be. So within each dispensary, there's got to be some brand that's making the efforts like Pure Beauty is doing. So try to look for those brands. And I know sometimes they may not offer or you might be really particular about what you smoke or consume and that brand might not have it. But try to give to those brands because they're really doing the right thing. Yeah, 100%. So, yep. Clarence Thomas says federal laws against cannabis may no longer be necessary. Can Clarence Thomas is uh, on the Supreme Court. He's one of the most conservative justices. And he said uh, the, uh, <laughs> that, the, that be the hodgepodge of federal policy on cannabis, federal laws against its use or cultivation, may no longer make sense. Good for you, Clarence Thomas. Uh, prohibition on interstate use of cultivation of cannabis may no longer be necessary or proper to support the federal government's piecemeal approach, he wrote. His views came as the court declined to hear the appeal of a Colorado medical cannabis dispensary that was denied federal tax breaks that other businesses are allowed. Thomas said the Supreme Court's ruling in 2005 upholding federal laws making cannabis possession illegal may now be out of date. And let's all be clear, Clarence Thomas has been around a long, long time. He's been on the Supreme Court mm -hmm. for a long time. Federal policies of the past 16 years have greatly undermined its reasoning, he said. The federal government's current approach is a half-in, half-out regimen that simultaneously tolerates and forbids local use of cannabis. 
36 states now allow medical cannabis, and 18 also allow recreational use, but federal tax law does not allow cannabis businesses to deduct their business expenses. Under this rule, a business that is still in the red after it pays its workers and keeps its the lights on might nonetheless owe substantial federal income tax, Thomas said. The Department of Justice has instructed the nation's federal prosecutors not to pursue cases against cannabis businesses that follow state law. And since 2015, Congress has prohibited the Justice Department from spending federal money to prevent states from carrying out their own laws. But the IRS continues to enforce its own rules against growers and dealers. The federal government's willingness to look the other way on cannabis is more episodic than co- that episodic that coherent, Thomas said. I think his wife owns a dispensary too. Hmm. Um, from what I read, if a very conservative that's been on the Supreme Court and been in justice for a long time is for it and a lot of government officials are against it and other supreme court and the president and everybody else is against it but you got a man of the, of integrity that's been around for a long time i don't know i think he's making sense um yeah that North Carolina senators approved medical cannabis bill in the committee. Man, I hope it goes legal there. I hope it goes legal in North Carolina. Uh, Pennsylvania raises medical cannabis purchase limits, and then they make some other changes, uh, making it easier to remove contaminants such as yeast and mold, allowing them to turn the contaminated cannabis into trop- topicals but not inhaled or ingested products. Hmm. Uh, makes permanent the ability of dispensaries to sell cannabis products curbside, a service that was first allowed during the coronavirus, adds cancer remission therapy and neuropathies of central nervous systems to the list of medical conditions for which medical cannabis can be recommended as treatment. Good for you, Pennsylvania. I know that government wants to legalize it rec soon, too. Now, South Dakota cannabis activists unveil four legal, uh, legalization initiatives for 2022 ballot pending Supreme Court decision. Didn't that f- state, like, last November vote to be medical and recreational all at once? What the heck? Oh, my God. It still just drives me nuts. Uh, Texas GOP cannabis activists pushed governor's support for the reforming, uh, uh, reform of cannabis during special session. We'll see what comes out of that. Uh, cannabis deliveries are legal in, in, in Boston, and cannabis couriers have started rolling out. Hmm. Roll it out, baby. Um, the state's Cannabis Control Commission approved both to start making deliveries on recreational cannabis back at July 3rd. Um, the company was uh, Your Green Package, and We Can Deliver Boston. Cool. Now you're going to have weed delivered right to your door. They're gonna, they want to both be the Uber of weed. Hmm. I think that's great. If you mm-hmm. can't leave your house yeah. and you give somebody to deliver it to, and you go on the menu and go, send it to my yeah. house. And they come, give the guy a five spot, and you got your weed. I think it's great. Uh, Apple now allows cannabis businesses on its app store while Google maintains ban. Here's something crazy. Google, the owner... And why he called it Google was the sounds that his bong made when he used to get high. And I'm not saying he doesn't get high anymore, I don't know. But back in college when he got high, that's the sound his bong made, so he named the company Google. And you still maintain ban on cannabis to (laughs) make apps on Google. Very weird. But Apple now allows apps in the App Store. That's kind of cool. I mean, I guess. I mean... We never affects me, does it? (laughs) Never. You never get too high. (laughs) That's the whole great thing about cannabis. You just never get too high. So you just keep (laughs) on smoking. (laughs) No, you've gotten too high. (laughs) I have. I have all met it. (laughs) What are some of the reasons that weed might affect people? I remember one, and it's probably, mm-hmm. I think it's what we read in research. One was everyone always says you never get high the first time you smoke cannabis. I did. I don't know. Or you get else. too high. Or you get too right? high. So, but what are some of the, what are the five reasons weed's not affecting people? Yeah. I've got an article here about 
the reasons weed might not be affecting you. There's a lot of variety when it comes to the cannabis experience. Nowadays, there are dozens of options to try from strains to different methods of consumption. Some people prefer strains that make them sleepy, while others prefer ones that make them energetic and joyful. And then there are those consumers who just don't see what the fuss is um, because they're not feeling anything. While cannabis can be used for multiple purposes, it should provide the consumer with an experience that's soothing and pleasant. If every time you smoke, you're not getting anything out of it, there must be an explanation behind it. And here are five reasons why the cannabis might not be affecting you. You inhaled wrong. It may sound silly, but inhaling smoke is not easy, especially if you haven't smoked anything before. It takes a few tries for people to get it right. In order to successfully inhale smoke and get cannabis into your bloodstream, you must inhale through the mouth deeply until you feel your belly expand. Like the first time you smoked a bong. <laughs> yeah. um, the first time I smoked, I was, I think, like eight. and um, Smoked a cigarette. Yeah. Okay. So I grew up in a house of all girls and I was the youngest and my oldest sister propped me up on the counter and they were doing this whole like, I don't know, maybe that was the second time. There was a time where they dressed me up like one of the Coneheads from <laughs> from SCTV. I was the Coneheads daughter, Dan Aykroyd's daughter, and I had a six pack of beer and a smoke in my hand. Saturday Night Live, right? Was that Saturday Night Live? Yeah, that Saturday wasn't Night SCTV. Yeah, yeah that was Night Saturday Night Live. Um, anyway, the first time I smoked, I was about eight. My oldest sister props me on the counter, puts a smoke in my mouth, lights it, and says, suck on it like it's a straw. I was like, <gasps> yeah. And I choked oh. for a long time. And coincidentally, my mom was holding me in the chair while I'm crying and choking. And my dad pulled up in the driveway, and I was like, yeah, she's going to be so busted. <laughs> <laughs> she got in trouble. Anyway. Inhalation. It's a big deal, right? If you don't know how to smoke, you'd be like I was that night and you'd be crying and choking, right? So you have to get like that flow of inhalation down and you have to understand it and you have to learn how to do it. Maybe it's not for you, right? But if you don't get the inhalation proper, um, it, it just won't, it's not going to work, right? And a lot of people think that holding the smoke in longer produces a, lo a stronger response, but that is likely their brain tricking them due to oxygen deprivation. Hmm. So anyway, take your inhale, exhale slowly. That way you can minimize the reduce of a coughing fit. So you may have to learn better how to inhale. Um, maybe For it's all your, you newbie smokers yeah, out newbie there. newbie smokers. Um, and by the way, I still can't rip a bong for my life. I drool <laughs> every time. There's like so much to focus on. It's like you got to put your mouth on the opening, the the holders over here. You don't put your mouth on the. You put your lips mouth. on the inside of yes. it, right? Yeah, you right. Don't. Okay, so you you're sitting there with we your. We had lip. a friend at the house one time, and he never smoked a bong he before. Mouthed it. He, he like he oh like sucked God. that bong. We're like, what are you doing? <laughs> There were a lot of boys here, and there was a lot of laughing. Poor, <laughs> the poor kid will never never live that down. Well, he wasn't a kid at the time, but I call him a kid. <laughs> anyway, when you're smoking a bong, your lips are a little bit open. They're inside the neck of the bong. Your thumb is, and your your pointer finger are holding the little, bowl. you know, the bowl. And then your other hand is lighting, so you got to light the bowl. Then you got to inhale. Well, you've had your mouth over this freaking neck for like 10 seconds, and your lips are kind of open, so you drool. I don't know how to get this all you, down. You got to learn how to do it. Then you got to light right, it. Then you got to inhale. You, were trying, then you, gotta, you, you need to learn to do it with whole. It's there's so, so much, much. It's so much easier if you hold the bong in your hand up to your mouth. Then how do you light it and you pull the bowl? You light it with bowl. one hand, you pull it at the same time. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know how that makes it easier. It anyway, does. <laughs> people, it's a process. Find your apparatus There's that works for you. Than I like out my steamroller. You do. You do. And I like my steamroller. It that is a a bowl of sorts, and it is clear glass. So I advise any new smokers get whatever you smoke from in clear glass because it allows you to kind of see how much smoke has filled the chamber, and you can. Fully release your finger to inhale that smoke, or you can partially, you know, if you feel like you filled the chamber too much, meaning like too much smoke is in there, you can, you can kind of control you can your judge inhale. It. Yeah, you can judge it. By I how love, much smoke is in there. I love a clear smoke. So, 
Anyway, moving on. Maybe it's your first time. It's very common for first timers to have a strange first experience with cannabis, sometimes not even knowing what they feel. This is my my biggest point that I could ever make to a new smoker is you don't know. It's kind of like your first time you get drunk. You get too drunk and then you don't even know you know, where is up and where is down. So you didn't have a good experience because you didn't even enjoy it. The same with smoking. You, I, you have to do it more than once. Like if you're that person who puked or got paranoid and like hid under a desk, don't give up on it. Like maybe do a little less next time and baby steps, baby step your way into it because when and if you get the grasp of cannabis and how it works with your body, it really is a process to learn it. Yeah. it. You have to learn how you feel and all the feelings that happen while you're smoking. Right now I'm really high. I don't even feel like I'm high. But it's it's a matter of engaging with it and really going through the process. So um, anyway. Can I tell it, you a story about the first time I got drunk? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I ever told you this. I don't think so. I was 12. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I was twelve. You're a young lad. I was I was in Long Island mm -hmm. with my cousins, spending like all the girls. All, no, it was just my two cousins, my twins. One passed okay. away. The first one that got me stoned. Yeah. And uh, at thirteen, but I was spending the week like it was like a long week, mm -hmm. and my brother and I were there, and my other cousins lived in Long Island, Dominic and Dario, mm -hmm. and there it was their birthday party. They were twins, also kind of weird, and uh, so. My aunt and my one cousin and myself had to go over there to do laundry because her laundry machine broke down. They were having this party anyway, so we went there. You went to the family party with your basket. It wasn't of laundry. a family party. Okay. It Just was a small Dominic party. and Dario's birthday party. Okay, their eighteenth birthday party, and there was sixty, seventy people there, all seventeen, eighteen, nineteen year old kids. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember. So. Out in the garage was where the bar was at, and I'm just sniffing drinks, <laughs> sip, taking sips of anything off the table, uh. just drinking. <laughs> so I'm really, really, really drunk now, and I had to use the bathroom. And, and I'm, everyone thought it was funny at first. At first. I go up to the bathroom, and the window was open, and I smelled cannabis at 12. Remember, I've, I've told you yeah, all. I've, yeah. I've, I've, I know You've, what it smelled like. I've right. smelled it. All of a sudden, I put my head out the window, and I start yelling. At all, they're all down below the window, and I start yelling, Are you smoking weed down there? <laughs> Everybody that's smoking. I'm screaming this at 12 years old. Wow. Wasted. They kicked the door down. They did? This is 1982. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, you're. 80, 82, 83, 82. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs about weed. Oh my gosh! And there's neighbor houses. You know, it's not. It was a tight right. neighborhood, Italian neighborhood in Long Island. It was like all Italians living around this neighborhood, and probably more than just. It was just to me. It was just I was young, so I'm screaming this. They you know, <laughs> if you get drunk or too high now, you still scream and yell things <laughs> and act kind of crazy. <laughs> what were you yelling the other night? Fourth of July, you were yelling stuff. Oh man, just being silly. So. They kicked the door down. Oh, shit. And grabbed me by my shirt. And this big football player dude carried me out to the garage where everybody was at and sat me down at one of the tables. There's a very pretty young lady sitting at that table. And I start talking to her like I had game. <laughs> my cousin Dominic and, cousin, and their older brother Ernie, I don't really remember much after that. They grabbed me and threw me in the living room where my Aunt Laura was beating the shit out of me because I was trying to... I had my tongue down this girl's mouth. Ew, you're a young boy. She you was like 17, pervert. 18 years old, and I'm trying you're, to make out with this girl. You're dirty. <laughs> you're dirty. I got the shit kicked out of me by my Aunt Laura. Now, she was no small Italian woman. She had to be about... She was a very big woman, and, and she beat the shit out of me, yelling at me, I'm so embarrassed by you right now. I'm not even oh your parents. <laughs> <laughs> you, never, you never got to go back to that party, did you? <laughs> no more family parties oh for, my God. for Mr. Weedman. Oh, my God. I'm sorry I interrupted. I just had to tell that story about oh the first gosh. time I was drunk. It's pretty bad. That's but pretty I smelled bad. weed at a party Yeah, at 12. You could identify I it. I probably would have went and smoked it if I wasn't up in the bathroom. Well, you shouldn't have. <laughs> All right. Let's get back on track. 
So uh, anyway, it's your first time. So maybe you just don't even know what you're experiencing. So um, your body needs to learn how to get high. It has to recognize how it feels. Some experts also mention a cam cannabis sensitization period, which is a period of time where you won't experience that high feeling due to your body developing more cannabinoid receptors as you start exposing it to more THC. That's something new I didn't never heard. I didn't realize that you develop more. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, another reason you might not feel high is that you are using a consumption method that doesn't work for you. Uh, whenever you try out a new cannabis method, it helps to assume that you're starting from scratch and are going through another sensitization period. Edible highs and inhaled highs are very different, so it's important to be exposed to these methods several times before you get a grasp on how that particular high is supposed to feel. And then there's genetics, wonderful genetics. They can be good, they can be bad. I'll tell you. Tell us. <laughs> right? Uh, your genes might also play a role in the way in which you experience cannabis highs. Data shows that people with the genetic mutation in the AKT1 are more likely to experience paranoia and anxiety when smoking weed. There are also people who naturally have more endocannabinoids than others, experiencing stronger highs. This all means that there's no way of predicting the way in which cannabis acts in your body. Everyone is different, and the only way you learn what works for you is to try out different things. And then we have tolerance levels. Some people have insane tolerance levels. Uh, cannabis tolerance levels vary. Uh, many things impact your tolerance, from your age, your genetics, the frequency of your consumption. Tolerance plays a part in how your body reacts to cannabis, with some people only need, needing one hit to get off on an anxiety spiral. Others may smoke more and feel very little. Try out different methods and amounts of cannabis you ingest. Get a feeling for what your body responds to. That's so, cool. That's pretty helpful. Yeah, right? it's a great, great, great article on that one. Yeah. So. Um, international news, Seoul court, Seoul Korea court sentences ex-BTOB Loon to two years in prison for cannabis use. Manila Bulletin says, poor young man, getting fined about $117,000. He was with, he's a K-pop boy band, BTOB. Man, yeah. come on, South Korea, legalize it, will you? Portugal parliament ignites adult use conversations all over Europe, saying, uh, Portugal's gonna be different than some of the other countries medical and legalization is going to be a very very fast up and coming um cannabis country so we'll see what happens there go for you portugal we want to go there one day uh international cannabis corp to stop producing for uruguay's legal cannabis market uruguay is one of the first legal cannabis countries and they get a lot of international cannabis uh, sent to them. It's only like 10 milligrams THC is the, or 10% uh, THC is the limit there. Uh, but they're going to start having some uh, cannabis grown in the States finally, in the state, which is great. And it's going to uh, be a little more higher THC limits. And um, a lot of companies kind of iffy about going there also or sending stuff there because cannabis prices are very low. So we'll see. But stronger cannabis is coming your way, Uruguay. So look forward to that. Uh, Zimbabwe ignites green industry fund to lure foreign cannabis investors. Uh, Zimbabwe is allowing 100% ownership in enterprises, including funds from outside the country. Zimbabwe, learn to do it yourself. Don't let outside investors control your cannabis. Trust me on that one. Uh, Mexico's president floats referendum option on recreational cannabis after court says it's to, says to legalize. That's cool. So let's see what happens when Mexico legalizes. And find, I mean, we've been talking about Mexico for like mm -hmm. over a year now. Uh, Thailand... Four cannabis strains will be registered as items of national heritage. I thought this was awesome. They've been doing cannabis for a long time there. A lot of great uh, cannabis strains have come from there. Uh, so good for Thailand. So let's see what are the four strains that they were talking about. Uh, Bangkok, the country's Ministry of Public Health reports the four cannabis strains from Thailand will be registered as items of national heritage to promote research into their use. Minister, I'm sorry if I say this wrong, a Newton Charvin Vocal said these strains are called ST1, TT1, UUA1, and RD1. The strains registrations are currently awaiting certification by the Agricultural Department, and, pro and the process, <coughs> excuse me, everyone, is expected to be completed in August. 
He said research into the strains, benefits, and uses will be conducted by the Department of Medical Sciences in conjunction with the university's technology. Um, uh, and he also said that they would add research would uh, generate uh, economic benefits for the country as well as boost farmers' potential to compete in the global market, which will help reduce the trade deficit. Furthermore, the DMS, the DMS discovered that cannabis root can help restore function in lungs, which have been damaged by the COVID-19 inf infection. Hell yeah! That's pretty awesome to read. So, good for you, Thailand. What's the capital of Thailand? Bangkok! <laughs> About 10.6 million Nigerians are, are actively, it says here, abusing cannabis, but I'm just going to say using cannabis because yeah, it's right? illegal in Nigeria, and it's like one of the big, it's the biggest thing that they do there, and, and they don't want to legalize it. And the chairman of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, Baba Marwa, the chairman of the National Drug Enforcement, has laminated over the persuasive abuse substance in the country. I don't think so, man. Get out of here. So they have a war against drugs abuse. Uh, uh, at the United Nations and trying to fight this there. So, man, get out of here. I don't know, man. So you just need to legalize it there. People want it. 10.6 million Nigerians say they want it. Hmm. Legalize it. Yep. Uh, cannabis laws in Latin America. Uh, let's see here. Chile. Cannabis is still mostly illegal in Chile, though the country has the highest per capita consumption in Latin America. While public opinion is for it, the political opinion is against it. <laughs> uh, Uruguay, as we know, is there, uh, the, if there is a pioneer of cannabis legalization in Latin America, it's Uruguay. Since 2013, they legalized both medical and recreational cannabis. Though there is a pushback from banks due to sanctions associated with the, with the herb, the negative perception has also led to only about 17 of 1,000 pharmacies stocking medical cannabis products. Hmm. Peru. Legalization in Peru started in early 2019. It allows for cultivation processing, importation, exportation, and commercialization of regulated medical cannabis products. These products are licensed through the Peru Director General of Medicine, Supplies, and Drugs. While recreational cannabis is still legal, it is acceptable to have up to 8 grams for personal use. Colombia is plagued with a bad reputation when it comes to drugs such as cocaine associated with its drug cartels. Cannabis has been bundled up with this reputation, getting its label Planta Que Mata, which means the plant that kills. Oh my God! Gosh, hmm. it doesn't kill anybody. In 2015, a law was passed to regulate medical cannabis, allowing it to be grown, processed, imported, and exported as long as you have the federal license. So that means you'll never get it. In 2016, home cultivation uh, medical use uh, were legalized. With those developments, there is hope for its name to change the planta que sana, the plant that heals. Yay! Brazil. One of the most popular destinations for tourists in Latin America that must be approached with caution. The police are very strict and notorious for preying on tourists who want to enjoy cannabis on their visit. The best option is to try it in private. Venezuela. With an unstoppable political climate that adds to the tension, Venezuela is not an ideal place to get on the wrong side of the law for cannabis possession. You can face imprisonment and conviction. Worse, still you have to face up to years before sentencing, so it's best to avoid it. Conclusion on this, though, Latin America has gone a long way in legalizing cannabis, but there is still room for improvement. The countries taking the lead are Uruguay, Peru, Chile, and Colombia, while Brazil and Venezuela are lagging, depending on your intentions of travel to these countries. So be careful or don't be careful. It's up to you. We talk about nonviolent cannabis crimes on this, on this show a ton. I know there's a lot of States now clearing cannabis convictions. Illinois has done a good job on that, clearing over 700,000 uh, cannabis convictions. And, and I know other states are doing it. Is there some sort of a tool out there to like help people with this that we researched and, and, and cleared yeah. from their record? Yep, yep, yep. Um, there's a tool, it's software, that is being developed to help any with an, anyone with an old marijuana conviction. They will help this person app eventually it will become an app will help clear it from their record wow um and eh, maybe it's not an app it's a it's a program software um in many states it's possible to have some past convictions removed from your record but the process is time consuming and expensive this background check company is automating it nearly one out of every three american adults has a criminal record i did not know it was that much um Damn. 
And when they fill out an application for a job, a new apartment, a loan, or even to attend college, there's a good chance that that record might mean that they get rejected. In many cases, it's possible to have the record expunged, meaning that it would no longer show up on background checks. However, that process is complicated and expensive and thus out of reach for most people. A new tool from Checker, that's C-H-E-C-K-R, a company that works to make employer background checks more fair, makes those expungements easier. We're trying to streamline the process as much as possible with automation, says Daniel Yanis, CEO of Checker, which partnered with Lawyaw, a company that automates legal workflows, and the law firm Avenues Legal to build the tool. While some might normally have to pay a lawyer uh, $1,500 and file stacks of paperwork, the new tool automatically completes most of the process by asking for the answers to just a few simple questions. Attorneys are still necessary for some steps in the process, which is different in every county in the U.S. But over time, as the tool is developed further, software may be able to handle everything. The cost can almost come down to zero once we get to full automation, Yanis says. Right now, as the tool launches, with a focus first on expunging cannabis records in California, the cost of the process will drop from $1,500 to between $350 and $500, depending on the charge. Checker applied for a grant, along with using $100,000 of its own funding, to cover the full cost for 1,000 participants over the next few months and hopes to get additional grants to expand this free offering. I think only when it's free to the consumer and frictionless that we can get to a scale of helping millions of people go through the process, he says. The software builds on Codes for America's work to automatically clear. So Codes for America's, I'm going to have to do some research on. They It sounds like they work on cannabis convictions, on uh, expunging them. Cool. Um, so the software builds on Code for America's work to automatically clear more than 140,000 records of cannabis convictions in California, where cannabis has been legal for recreational use since late 2016. Courts are required to expunge these old records themselves, but the process is so inefficient that it can take years for it to happen if someone doesn't initiate the process themselves. Tens of thousands of other people in the state will be able to use Checker's tool, which the company plans to expand to other states and other types of convictions. We're starting in California, but this can be available anywhere in the U.S., says Yanis. There are processes in every single state, so it's just a question of funding for us to increase our coverage, increase our level of automation, reduce the cost, and be able to offer the service to as many Americans as possible. That's really our goal. A growing number of companies are reworking hiring strategies to be fairer to people with criminal records, like the body shop, which shifted to an open hiring policy, which means the company essentially hires the first person who applies for many positions. I've never heard of that. Um, Pretty neat. Uh, But most employers still consider background checks a vital part of the application process. In terms of giving second chances, being more open in hiring criteria is still a very early movement, Yanis says. We're definitely working with a lot of companies who have decided to be more progressive. I would say the shortage of workers in the U.S. is also good pressure to encourage any business to rethink their eligibility criteria. But it's still relatively limited. So this is why expunging records is really key and really effective, because it clears the criminal record at the source. So we have to watch for future progress with that tool. That's yeah. pretty neat. Yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, why should somebody not be able to get a job because of cannabis? That's just like someone, silly. just like someone can't run in the Olympics, right? For using cannabis. It's just the rules. Rules. Stomp rules need to change. The stigma. stigma. Yep. Free the plant. <laughs> NFL Hall of Famer Calvin Johnson started a cannabis business, and his favorite activities while using it are fishing and artwork. Hmm. Former uh, NFL uh, player Calvin Johnson is the founder of his own cannabis business, Primitive, or P-R-I-M-I-T-I-V. Primitive. Primitive. All right. Johnson said he often smoked uh, cannabis after games, and it helped alleviate pain in a holistic way. Johnson now hopes to end the common stigmas 
stomp the stigma around cannabis among athletes. So he um, he stayed away from cannabis growing up and fear of his mother's repercussions. Hmm. But fast forward to 2021, the NFL Hall of Famer has founded the new career path in leading his own cannabis brand, Primitive, alongside his former Detroit Lions teammate, Rob Sims. Johnson and Sims want to make high-quality cannabis available, a mainstream market, including professional athletes. But the first step is to change the negative outlook around cannabis that was prevalent among members of his family and community growing up. Anybody you know, especially in the in the Brown community, they were really heavily penalized for having cannabis, Johnson told Insider. Being black folks, that's why it was so in our community and in our families. It was so heavily stigmatized. Over 8.2 million Americans were arrested for cannabis from 2001 uh, to 10, according to American Civil Liberties Union, and black Americans were 3.73 times more likely than whites to be charged for possession. But several states have decriminalized cannabis over the past decade and some have even legalized it for recreational use. Now, Johnson and Sims aspire to be an industry leaders for the product that was critical for them and other NFL players in coping with pain uh, sustained from playing football. Uh, using cannabis became a routine part of Johnson's football career. Johnson first tried cannabis during his freshman year at Georgia Tech, and right away he began to question the negative stigmas he grew up hearing about the plant. Of course I thought about my mom, and nobody thinks this is a good thing to do, Johnson said. Then tried it, and I was like, whoa, what is this? <laughs> this, is, this was my first thought. It was like, whoa, what is this, after trying it? And it was like walking on clouds almost. <laughs> <laughs> when Johnson entered the NFL in 20, 2007, as the number two overall draft pick by the Detroit Lions, cannabis became a medical necessity to deal with the pain of the professional game. It was really irregular and more social during the college days. In college life, it was, it, it's crazy. You didn't really deal with the injuries that you deal with in the league, Johnson said. Once you get to the league, injuries are just everywhere. But in college, you didn't have the injury bug, and you weren't really sore. Well, you were also 18, 19, 20, 21, and a lot younger, mm -hmm. <laughs> and not going up against professional athletes are the best of the best of the best. So... Uh, Johnson didn't sustain a single injury during his three-year career at Georgia Tech, but during nine seasons in Detroit, Johnson suffered multiple injuries to his knees, ankles, and fingers. Still, he played through much of the pain and only missed eight games across his career. Cannabis was one of the remedies that allowed Johnson to play through the pain. Still, it didn't replace prescription painkillers like uh, tor Toradol, which he took before and during games to cope without impairments to focus on physical dexterity. Johnson only ever used cannabis after games when the Lions were playing at home. But when Johnson did use cannabis, he would often invite other players into the mix as well. The majority of the locker rooms, if they are not currently participating, they have smoked or used cannabis in some application, Johnson said. If we're hanging, that was our preferred vice. I'm not a big drinker at all. But if we were hanging and it was a couple of fellas, that would be our first choice. For Johnson, using cannabis has even amplified his passions outside football. I'm fishing. I might be drawing or doing some artistry. It all depends, Johnson said. I do feel like sometimes, depending on what you have, you can disperse some creative thoughts. I like to keep my notebook handy because I might get some interesting thoughts I might want to jot down. Johnson wants to help normalize cannabis use for NFL players. NFL players have historically faced harsh punishments for testing positive for cannabis, including fines and suspensions. But the league eased up on its discipline this offseason. Players won't be fined or suspended for testing positive for cannabis from April 20th to August 9th for, uh, for the first time, thanks to the new collective bargaining agreement passed on March of 2020. The NFL is also going to experiment with cannabis as an official sponsored treatment for its players. The league announced it would invest $1 million in funding for research into pain management and cannabinoids on June 8th. Johnson hopes the partner to partner Primitive with the NFL and share that research uh, that his company has done alongside professors at Harvard. If he does get the chance to sit at the tables with the NFL executives to work on potential partnerships, he already has an idea of the pitch he would deliver. I would literally just ask them to do research. There, that's where we find cures. That's how we find solutions. That's uh, they've got to start somewhere. And research on this particular category is obviously category one for some reason. It's illegal. You can't even do it. So it's been a crime that's been. Uh, that it's been category one for so long. And now they're allowing universities to do research. I think the biggest thing in the NFL can do is to help do research. I think that's great. I like Calvin Johnson. He was a great football player, NFL home, Hall of Famer. You know, I love that that cannabis has kind of been holistic medicine for him. It's also brings his creativity out, like we always mm -hmm. say. 
you know, good for him. I hope uh, because of who he is and how he's used cannabis in the past, I hope other football players enjoy it and get to – I hope the NFL really, really does what they say they're going to do. Another football player who I really enjoyed watching in his college career, he had a good – I wouldn't say a great NFL career. He probably could have been one of the best running backs of all time. Uh, Texas Ricky Williams. Uh, he says he wouldn't have won the Heisman without cannabis. Uh, Ricky Williams credits his cannabis uses towards winning the Heisman in 1998. He got a lot of slack um, using cannabis in the NFL. I mean, he was suspended. Um, they kind of marked him on that. It was kind of some bullshit. But let's read this. From the second he arrived on campus, it was evident he would be a star. How much so? Well, he won the Heisman in 1998 and is Texas' all-time leading rusher. But there's so much more that meets the eye with Ricky Williams, perhaps one of the faces of Texas football. In recent years, he found a calling in business, working on developing his own strain of cannabis called Highsmith. That's the Williams most people know today, an advocate of cannabis usage for professional athletes. What fans of the 40 Acres might not have known is the, whole, the role his usage played in 1998. During an interview with SI's Greg Bishop, Williams said he would initially smoke after breaking up with his girlfriend. A roommate suggested it would calm his nerves and, and help him relax. It did along with setting up one of the greatest running back seasons in the history of college football. In Williams' senior season, he rushed for 2,124 yards and broke the NCAA career rushing record on his way to winning the Heisman. I wouldn't have won the Heisman without it, Williams said of his cannabis usage. William told Bishop he believes he would be in the Hall of Fame had sports back then would have uh, been more accepting of cannabis, more understanding, closer to what they are today. He stated that the former Saints coach, Mike Dicker, used to call him aloof due to his uh, qu his quiet demeanor and nicknamed him Ricky Weirdo. <laughs> Dick a man. Jeez. <laughs> In reality, the NFL did not understand Williams' social anxiety. In the last two decades, the league has become more outspoken on issues such as depression and anxiety that could be caused outside the game. Williams finished his time with the Longhorn Longhorns as college football's top player. Currently, he still holds the record for the most rushing yards all time by a Longhorn player, most in a single season. Never forgetting his roots, Williams' cannabis business comes in three flavors, one of which is wrapped in burnt orange foil representing his time at Texas. The other two are covered uh, in black and gold for his time at, with the Saints and Dolphins teal for his revitalizing time in Miami. He, he, when, he, when he was in with the Saints, they expected so much out of him. You know, and he, he wind up stepping away for a minute and then got picked back up by the Dolphins, and his, he had some really good, good seasons with the Dolphins. Uh, Williams might be the biggest mystery of the NFL due to the ruling on cannabis charges, but he, he holds no regrets. His usage might have shortened his playing career, but also helped him become one of the great players in Texas history. So, and good for you, Ricky Williams. I know you have always been an advocate for cannabis. You've always spoken about it, and now you did this article. It was great that we got to read and how it helped you. Um, here's another athlete out there used cannabis to help him heal, to help him just not on the field, but off the field with social anxiety and, and his depression. So get with the times. For all of you that don't know out there, there is another cannabis holiday. It's probably not as big as 420, because um, 420 has been around a, long, a lot longer, but it is a holiday for cannabis dab users, and it's called... Uh, 710, a.k.a. National Dab Day. And if you're counting the days to the next 420, we have good news for you. The famous April 20 stoner holiday has a lesser known and little appreciated cousin, July 10th, National Dab Day. Why July 10th, you ask? Well, if you take the number 710 and flip it over, it spells oil. Go ahead, Mrs. Wee Man, turn your computer over and see if it spells oil. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um... Cannabis oils are used uh, in the extraction process for cannabis concentrates like dab, shatter, amber, etc. For the dab enthusiasts, oil deserves a lot of celebration. Compared to the deep-rooted 420, this can of holiday is still relatively new. The day first appeared on Urban Dictionary in 2011, and the first reported celebration it was in... I've heard of, I heard about it in 2013, so um, when I first heard about it. Uh, but despite in recent origins, the creation story of National Dab Day or Oil Day is a bit hazy. No one person has officially claimed ownership of the idea of using the number 710 to reference cannabis oil. One account that is widely accepted claims the concept came from a conversation an underground rapper named Task Rock had in a chat room. 
The group was complaining that there should be a time of day to use dab since 420 felt too dated. TaskRock reportedly proposed 710 because it looked like oil upside down, and that time stuck. The holiday was later popularized as dabs and other cannabis extracts and concentrates uh, became more accessible in the states where cannabis was legal. Task Rock even released an album called The Movement, which called for 710 to replace 420 as the primary cannabis holiday. Uh, so uh, they'll be on 710, there'll be tons of discounts on concentrates, probably every dispensary across the country. Um, there also might be some events. Then I'll check your area. Uh, try a new concentrate if you've never dabbed before. It's not for the newbie, um, but you could try a cartridge, try some oil. Uh, so they they are a little bit stronger. Their THC percentage usually runs between sixty eight percent, and I've seen it as high as ninety eight percent. So, just if it's your first time, just be careful. Um, watch some cool stoner flicks <laughs> on seven ten. Uh. Here's a good one. Refresh your dab safety knowledge. Uh, we're not trying to, to mom you, but it's important to remember that dabs can be dangerous for those who lack experience. Cannabis concentrates are much more potent than other forms of cannabis, and the extraction process itself is risky. It's best not to try anything without a friend with you in case things go south. And if you need a refresher, uh, check out some tips on the, on the Internet. Um, grab your dabs at 710 a.m., p.m., whatever, both times if you want. Uh, and then here's another thing. If you're not a dabber, a little dab will do you. Make yourself some can of butter with uh, with oil. It could be coconut oil. It could be uh, a distillate oil that you buy. It could be an RSO that you buy. Just be very careful uh, when you're using concentrates in your edibles because it's a lot stronger, a heavy hitter, extremely potent. So as we always say with edibles, take it slow. Start low, go slow. So... Happy 710 day. Mrs. Weedman wasn't too familiar with 710. Well, because I can't even smoke a bong. <laughs> I surely couldn't do well, dabs. You, 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 I mean, you do cartridges. You do oils. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's high potency. Oh, because you could do, you could do, um, you could do dabs in a vape, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You've but done that. I think it's way, I don't think I can handle it. You haven't it, done I? it out of a rig. No. But you've done it out of a, you've done it out of a, 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 a vaporizer, like a small little vaporizer yeah. you have. So, uh, and you've only taken small hits. You have, Very but small. doing it out of a, a, a dab rig. That's serious business. It, it's, it's, it, man, I've seen people do some fucking dabs that would blow your mind. I mean, like I've seen people that, that w would do like two feet long dab. I was watching a guy on Instagram. He had a sheet of dabs and was just putting it in his Jeez. rig and just kept on going and smoking and kept on going and smoking and like did a whole entire I run guess of his, it. His tolerance is. <sighs> I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of people on Instagram and Facebook and a lot of social media do some heavy dabbing. <laughs> and for me, if I did that heavy dabbing, I mean, I smoke. I smoke a lot. But I smoke flour. And I smoke a lot of flour. I've smoked dabs. I smoke cartridges. But they're just not. It's just too. If I just want to be paralyzed on the couch for a few hours, a little dab will do you. That's just my, <laughs> my the way it hits me. But I don't do it enough to build my tolerance up from it. And I like flour, but I'm gonna I'm gonna eat an edible filled with oil on seven ten. Probably smoke my cartridge and do that. So, but yeah, that's the show, everybody. Happy seven ten. Have celebrate. Go crazy. Go crazy. Seven ten. Another another <laughs> another cannabis national world holiday. So go brazy, everybody. Just do it. <laughs> You know, so happy 710, everybody. But that's the end of the show. You got anything else to say, Mrs. Weed Man? No, I think we had a good show here. I think it was great. I think I could smoke some more of that weed. We definitely got to smoke some more of that weed as, we soon, are, as, right? as soon as I hit stop. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming back and listening. Thanks for uh, all of your support. We love all the DMs, so keep them coming. Yep. Emails. Sharing is caring. Yep. Tell your friends and family about our show. Uh, we constantly are watching and seeing new areas of the world popping up as listeners, and we love it. So yep. come back for more. From all around the world, we love you. Have a great 710. As Polly always says, smoke smart. Puff, puff, and away. Puff, puff, pass. <laughs>